Hello and welcome to uh, to our webinar today, Synodality and Lay Leadership from the Magisterium's Perspective. Uh, I am Paul Jarzembowski. I work at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in Washington, D.C., within the Secretariat of Laity, Marriage, Family Life, and Youth. Uh, and uh, we are grateful to collaborate on this webinar with the Catholic Apostolate Center um, and are just very grateful for their generosity in uh, hosting this space uh, and for, uh, for providing us this forum for this great conversation. Um, I am joined by uh, a very august panel of, uh, of leaders uh, from around the world, um, and uh, I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves. Um, and uh, as you'll see, uh, there are uh, several options for you as an audience member um, to be aware of. There are There is a chat, there is questions, there's polls and people, all kinds of things you see on your screen. We're going to ask that if you do have a question, and we do hope you will have questions for us, uh, that you use the questions feature. Uh, the questions feature is the one that we will be using throughout. Um, we know that there is a chat, and that is an opportunity for you to share ideas and thoughts. But the questions are the places where we would like for you to, uh, to give us some ideas. Um, we're going to give some initial comments uh, as we go along today. Um, but the latter half of our time together, uh, we're going to be able to dialogue with you uh, to hear to to receive your questions and to be able to respond to them in real time. So, uh, so please, we 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 look forward to that. Um, and for those who are watching this on the recording, uh, trust that your compatriots who have joined us on this webinar are going to ask all the questions that hopefully you were hoping would be asked as well. But without further ado, let's get into the conversation. Um, I'm going to invite uh, our panelists to introduce themselves to share a little bit who they are and where they're from. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, with Carrie. Thank you, Paul. I'm Carrie Robinson, and I am the founding executive director and now executive partner of Global and National Initiatives for Leadership Roundtable. I'm also a member of the Raska Foundation for Catholic Activities, and I'm joining you today from the beautiful state of Hawaii just to underscore that the Synod reaches every part of the globe. Thank you, Carrie. Father Wayne. Father well, Wayne Cavalier, I'm a friar of the Southern Dominican province. I direct the Kangar Institute for Ministry Development, and I direct the Doctor of Ministry program at Oblate School of Theology here in San Antonio, Texas. Wonderful. Sister Natalie. Yes, so I'm Sister Natalie, Xavier's sister, an Ignatian order for, from France, but I'm happy to greet you from Rome and to connect with you all uh, today. So, uh, because since February, I've been appointed by Pope Francis as under secretary to the Synod of Bishops. Thank you, good to be with you. Card Cardinal. Hi, I'm Cardinal Joe Tobin. I'm a, originally from Detroit, Michigan in the uh, great state of Michigan, but I'm speaking to you today from the great state of New Jersey. I am the, uh, I serve the Archdiocese of Newark uh, four counties in the uh, the northern part of New Jersey. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you very much. Yes, we have it from from Hawaii to Rome and uh, several places in between. Uh, we're really glad that we're here and all of you who are joining us, uh, wherever you're joining us from, uh, thank you for being here. We're going to begin in a spirit of prayer, uh, and we've invited uh, Cardinal Tobin to uh, to lead that prayer, which is uh, what the U.S. bishops uh, have put on our on their website as a uh, a prayer uh, uh, on uh, on for the synod uh, that is forthcoming. So, uh, so Cardinal, I'll, I'll pass it back over to you again. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name. With you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path, nor partiality influence our lives. Let us find in you our unity so that we may journey together to eternal life and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you, who are at work in every time and place in communion of the Father and the Son forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
Mary, Mother of the Church, pray for, pray us. for us. Thank you very much. In that prayer itself, we have the phrase journeying together, and I'm very, that, that, that phrase is found a lot, and we'll be hearing a lot of that phrase over the next couple of years. Um, and uh, I think that this is where we're going to kind of start here, is this is, this is the process of journeying together as a church on the synodal path um, that we've undertaken. We're, we're going to, what we really want to explore today is, uh, is really how the lay leadership of our church, how the laity in our church are, are to be engaged in the synodal process, which for many years, of course, the synodal process for, was often thought as something that was done at a at a higher level um, uh, or a level uh, you know somewhere uh, in the hierarchy, but but rather the synodal process really involves the laity, um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about how that really works. And so um, so to begin, I'd like to invite everyone to kind of offer their opening thoughts on this topic, but specifically asking you know kind of going around the question of why is the universal church uh, engaging in this conversation on synodality right now. Uh, and I could think of no better person to begin our conversation uh, than Sister Natalie, since she is in the uh, uh, office of the Synod um, in Rome. Uh, so Sister Natalie, I'll invite you to share a few thoughts. And I'm, I know we've got some visual images to go along with some of your thoughts as well. So Sister Natalie. Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, it's wonderful to be with you all today to share about this synod, we are already, all the church is convoked to uh, be part of this synod 21-23 for synodal church communion, participation and mission. Why? That's uh, the next slide, please. Because uh, after the synod on youth in 2018 and the synod on the Amazon, uh, it, it is clear, uh, and that was one of the main fruits of the synod on youth, that synodality is the way for the church today to be faithful to her mission, to proclaim the gospel, to transmit the faith. So uh, next slide, we understand with Pope Francis today, uh, and it's a very strong statement, that synodality is the way of being the church today according to the will of God in a dynamic of discerning and listening together to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So why are we all together called to be part of this synod? Because synodality is the call, uh, is a call of God. It's the vocation for the church in this uh, historic moment. And uh, as we can see in the next slide, synodality is uh, this synod is a way to uh, be more aware and to implement the style of a synodal church, that is the style of being the church all together. Uh, it's, it's a call to be protagonist. It's a call to, 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 to be missionary disciples as uh, baptized. All are protagonists. No one can be considered a mere extra. So we have this synod, really, uh, next slide, please, as a way to understand, but to live in our daily ecclesial life, uh, this uh, new style of church that is not new, in fact, it is a style from the church uh, uh, at the beginning. Uh, it's a vision that highlights first the baptism call. It's a way to think and to see the church as the people of God, as a, a style uh, of fraternity. Uh, next uh, slide, please. It's the way to be the church, like this logo uh, of the Synod. We are all together guided by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is working in everyone, is, lead, is leading all the diversity of the baptize, even uh, also blowing in other people. And so to be a synodal church, it's uh, rather simple. It is to, uh, uh, we have these three key words, communion, participation, mission. So it's a call to foster our communion, to call for participation of all, and especially the lay people, uh, for the mission, to proclaim the gospel. It's not first about an internal way to be the church, but to be a missionary church. That's uh, why we have this synod. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Natalie. Uh, Father Wayne, um, 
your thoughts on on why we are engaging in this conversation, the synodal conversation right now? Well, I want to begin by thanking um, you, Paul, and, and the folks over at the uh, Catholic Apostolate Center for um, these webinars. I, I think one of the key things is that a, a synod is not just a process of hearing people's voices. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of uh, what we call strategic planning and end up with, with nice plans that go on the shelf and nobody reads them and, and then everybody becomes cynical about the planning process. A synod is so much more than that. Um, it, is, it is a process of formation in itself. It's, it's, it is the participation of the people of God in being the people of God. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a key time in the church today, as Sister Natalie pointed out several times, uh, it's, it's the vocation of the church today. I think that's really important because I think what Pope Francis has recognized is that the church is at a new moment. Um, in many ways, he embodies that new moment because he is um, the first pope from uh, non-European countries since, I think, 741. Uh, it's a long time. Um, he is a representative of the dynamic church of Latin America that has engaged in the very kind of vocation that Sister Natalie just described, the vocation of um, reading the signs of the times and responding to those times by reflecting together and discerning the movement of the spirit in those times. Um, and I think the, the Pope Francis brings with him to his leadership of the church a recognition that we're at a point today within a world that is changing quickly and dramatically and, and dealing with many challenging situations that uh, are too many to, to even articulate at the moment, um, that we need to come together um, and to discern together the movement of the spirit, to read the signs of the times, um, not for what they what we want them to be for but for what they actually are and to understand how the spirit is moving within those signs and calling us to respond to those signs and um, i think pope francis brings that understanding and in calling the church to a synodal way of being not just a synod but a synodal way of being is naming that vocation that is an appropriate response for our times I love that phrase, by the way, a synodal way of being, um, not just a synod. So thank you. That's a wonderful kind of phrase there just to kind of kind of keep in mind. But Carrie, let, let me turn to you for a moment here and, and get your thoughts. Sure. Thank you, Paul. And I'm thrilled to be with the four of you, all friends and personal heroes of mine. My background is in Catholic philanthropy. Uh, our great grandparents created a Catholic foundation that has issued in more than 75 years of service to the global church, spanning five generations of our family. So from a very young age, it has been instilled in me to understand the blessing of baptism as conferring both rights and responsibilities. And I've taken lay agency, lay leadership, and uh, the lay, active lay participation in the life of the church very seriously all of my life. It, this, of course, culminated in helping Jeff Boise bring Leadership Roundtable to life to serve and strengthen the church by promoting co-responsibility, effective ethical leadership, and contemporary best practices that benefit the church and the church's mission. So I couldn't be happier to participate in this conversation with its emphasis on the role of the laity. Uh, as Sister Natalie said, as protagonists, but also more broadly in the Synod itself. Uh, I feel like I've waited my whole life for this moment. So why right now, you ask? Uh, one answer is there is no time like the present to initiate radically important hope-filled matters of great potential and positive consequence. Why I think it's happening now is that it, it is the culmination of all that Pope Francis, all of his pontificate. He's emphasized and prized co-responsibility, 
ordained religious and lay leaders working in partnership for the sake of the mission of the church. And he prizes diversity. In, in our own family and in, in Leadership Roundtable, we have an expression, everyone has a piece of the wisdom. We are all myopic on our own or in our narrowly defined groups. So we, we truly need the diversity of perspectives and experience to be better informed, to be healthier, to, to be whole. And now, um, given what Father Wayne just said, the fact that we are emerging from a pandemic where no part of the church or globe was spared of that experience. It seems particularly fortuitous to engage in dialogue, deep listening, deep prayer, imagination, and attentiveness to the Holy Spirit and to each other to literally dream a better way forward. So I'm thrilled that this moment has come. Thank you very much. Cardinal Tobin, um, we come to you. Your, your, your thoughts on, on this, on, on why we're engaging this right now. I think uh, an event that happened nine years ago helps me understand this, Paul. Uh, why now? It was 2012, and the church was preparing for a synod on the transmission of the gospel and recognizing that we were failing to, to pass on what had we had received. And I was reading one of the preliminary documents for that synod called the Lineamenta. And I was struck by the number of times the document mentioned discernment. I, th I think I even did a word count on uh, the file and it was like 24 uh, times within uh, 10, 15 pages. Now, that's a lot. I had read the preparatory documents for, I participated in five synods and I'm not sure discernment was used even a fraction of those that amount. So what that said to me, even at that time, and it's only been ratified since, the church recognizes that it's facing issues and challenges that don't have pre prefabbed instant just add water uh, solutions. And the process is not a parliamentary process, where we simply count up votes, and whoever has the most votes wins rather a discernment process, which is essentially a spiritual journey together, where we try our best to help each other understand what is God saying to the church today? And I think that's absolutely crucial. You know, uh, back uh, a, a little over a year ago, I, I had written to Pope Francis about something and got a little note back. And we, we uh, he was remarking on the, you know, the state of the question in those days. And he said, Tobin, we're in the middle of a crisis and nobody comes out of a crisis the same. They either come out better or they come out worse. And he, I don't think he said this, but what I heard, read between the lines, he said, the jury's still out. I think this synodal process is an opportunity for us to emerge from what Kerry described and what I think all of us have experienced, not simply with the pandemic, but other forces which have wounded the church and all, and centrifugal forces that threaten to fragment not only the church, but human society across the globe. The synodal process now is a chance to emerge as a better people and to try and involve more than a billion people across the world in this consultation is daunting, but the, uh, the prospects of it, I find exciting and hopeful. Thank you, Cardinal. So over the years since Vatican II, um, the church has really laid out a vision for how the laity, uh, in particular the lay apostolate and lay ministers, are engaging in the life of the church. But now, as you said, Cardinal, the, the, the Pope has kind of reinvigorated this vision uh, by widely engaging the laity uh, in these recent synodal processes. Um, and his, this wisdom has kind of framed a lot of his encyclicals and exhortations. Um, how have you seen uh, how this trajectory has played out uh, over the years, um, this trajectory of, of the engagement of the laity in these processes? 
Well, I think that uh, those of us who've been in the trenches realize that the, the input of all uh, and the laity or the majority of the church is important. It's, it's crucial. Uh, it's like, without that, it's, it's like trying to uh, see the picture with one eye closed, or maybe three quarters of the other one. Uh, the church has wonderful imagery, you know, from the word of God to describe a body that has uh, different members. And somehow they all are important working together with Christ who is the head of the body uh, to, to, to move forward towards the kingdom which Jesus preaches for she died and rose. So uh, I think the problem was that in the last millennium, you know, uh, the last thousand years, we increasingly had deconstructed ways in which people could participate in, in, uh, in the ascendental process. It was there, and if you read the Acts of the Apostles, when, once you get past the idyllic descriptions, in the first uh, couple of chapters of the Acts of the Apostles, then the, it gets real. It starts talking about the challenges, ethnic challenges, religious challenges, uh, things that threaten to tear the church apart. Yet that experience of the Holy Spirit that is, is uh, symbolized in the, uh, the Pentecost story is something that would not allow the people to just sit placidly and say, okay, I guess this is the way it is. So I, just as the involvement of all the people helped establish the order of deacons in uh, the, the first sort of ethnic crisis, and more importantly, uh, that Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 demonstrate uh, for us that, the, you know, to involve everyone in the discernment that is necessary informs the final decision and we have a greater uh, greater confidence that we can as a church say it, it occurs to us and to the Holy Spirit the following so yes yeah, it's Natalie yes I would be happy to to draw from that and uh, to continue um, uh, with uh, three photos that you can see, so I will ask uh, to help me with the slide. Uh, first, I would like to uh, we look at the slide 13. 13, it's the way uh, after, uh, you know, at, at the beginning of the church, as Cardinal Tobin said, the model of the church uh, is the one from uh, the act of the apostle, it's uh, the government of the church was collegial and synodal, and all the, the Christians feel they are one community. Uh, they, there is this idea that uh, we don't focus much on the differences of role and position, but we are one body, one community. Then for historic reasons, there was a way to look at the church in a more juridical way, pyramidical way. And this image is from uh, Vatican I, at the end of the 19th century, with the idea, you know, that the Holy Spirit is speaking mainly, only uh, through the Pope. You have this image. And uh, then, uh, so, so there was this emphasis and a lack of consultation, we can say, with the idea there are those who know uh, the pastors and the faithful just have to listen. Uh, then with Vatican II, and you can come back to uh, slide 11, was reintroduced the importance and the way to, that the Pope is not alone. Uh, there is this notion of collegiality. Uh, it's the Pope and the, the bishops are like the college of uh, the apostle, and the Pope needs to, uh, to have advice from all the, all, all the bishops. But now, they, but there was still a kind of competition between the primacy of the Pope and the collegiality of all the bishops. Then, with Pope Francis, we have, uh, and I like very much this photo on slide five. Uh, it's taken during uh, a break during the, the synod uh, on the youth. So, slide five, please. Uh, 
uh, yes, this one. Uh, you know, we have this idea and this experience of the church. Okay, the Pope is the Pope, the bishop remains a bishop, you have a cardinal, but we are in this style, uh, drinking together uh, with a style of dialogue, of fraternity, and the main output of the Synod on Youth, it was that the Pope and all the bishops, they were so happy uh, and they received a lot from the presence and the role of the lay people, uh, the young people. So now we have this, at this stage, we understand more that everybody, each voice matter, uh, the discernment of the pastors uh, begins uh, and should be done through the listening of all the voices because the Holy Spirit is speaking in each uh, in each one, and we are first this uh, church as a community, as uh, people of God, uh, missionary pilgrims. And I conclude just to explain that one of the key shift and key moment during the Vatican II Council was the choice in the main text about the church, Lumen Gentium to put chapter two on the people of God, all the baptized, before chapter three on the hierarchy. So that means that, uh, and Pope Francis says that, uh, pastors are part, uh, we can understand the hierarchy within the church through the lenses of this first and main focus on uh, all the baptized as protagonists because they have, or they also receive the, the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Sister Natalie. I, I, I love, first of all, I love the imagery. Um, uh, uh, and thank you very much for that. Um, I love the, the, the you, you, I think on the slide you call it the, the Mate Church. Um, yeah. You know, truly, uh, you know, sitting around a table, that table fellowship almost, even, even, even a high top like this, uh, to have that table fellowship um, of, of that model of church. So thank you for kind of uh, introducing that. Uh, we can kind of move off the slides for the moment. Um, uh, Father Wayne? Yeah, and, and uh, taking taking that idea, that image, uh, of course, um, which was uh, championed by Yves Kandar among uh, many of the the council of the, um, the, the presence of the spirit in all of the church um, and th what that calls forth from all of the baptized, right? The, the co-responsibility, as as um, uh, Pope Benedict uh, put it, for the being and activity of the church, this sense of the whole church being called to the mission of evangelization, um, and 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 so from the from its beginning with the uh, document on the liturgy, the the council called for full and um, conscious participation of all the members of the church. Uh, of course, in, in the liturgical uh, celebration, but from that, as, it, you know, as, as we pray, so we believe, um, the church calls forth full and conscious participation of all the baptized in the mission of evangelization that has been handed on to the whole church by Christ that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it is, is this sense of shared uh, participation and shared responsibility for the mission of evangelization that I think the Synod uh, captures, this sense of walking together toward the kingdom, as, as Cardinal Tobin pointed out, our end is always the kingdom, right? The, the reign of God. And um, we walk together as a pilgrim church toward that end, um, and and discern together the way forward um recognizing um i forget which which i think it might have been carrie who who mentioned the, the 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 need to to come together to share the truth of which we all have a participation but no one has uh an exclusive hold on it that it together we can discern more clearly the fullness of that truth um and I, I think that uh, Pope Francis comes from, again, that, that Latin American perspective that, that really received that um, teaching of Vatican II with its emphasis on evangelization um, and, and the share of all the baptized in the mission of evangelization. I think in the, 
in the US, our, um, our response, our reception of Vatican II was more about participation in the ministries of the church, whereas in Latin America, there was a sense of participation in the mission of evangelization. Um, and and a, a much a more outward focus um, than perhaps was demonstrated in, in the US. And I, I think that's partially a, a cultural reality for us being a pluralistic um, society. It's, it's, uh, it tends to turn us in toward ourselves. But I think Pope Francis is reminding us of the call. And it, it, I think his, his image is, is spectacular from Evangelii Gaudium, which, which the, the very title of the document reflects that of uh, Pope Paul VI's um, document on evangelization by Evangelii Nuziandi, uh, where he, he says, Jesus is knocking on the door of the church, not to get in, but to get out, <laughs> to get out of the church. It, it is the perfect image of what we're called to today. The sense of, um, we're not called to be secure in our shared faith, but to, to go out into the world and share that faith with those who, who are seeking um, the, the, the life that Christ can offer. Thank you. Uh, I want to kind of, now that we've kind of looked at where we want to be, now I kind of am thinking of where we were, are going to be going. Um, and, and so how do you, how do you see uh, the laity, especially lay leadership, lay ecclesial literature, leadership, um, engaged in the synodal path that we're following here, but also even what you hope that this synodal path will un unpack for lay leadership in the church. Um, Carrie, can I, I'd like to start with you on that. Um, uh, how do you, what do you hope and what do you, what do you think will happen in this synodal process uh, with our lay leadership? So one of the particularly exciting aspects for my colleagues and me at Leadership Roundtable is the partnership that we have with the USCCB and with ordinaries throughout the United States uh, to provide facilitation of the Synod. Um, as soon as we were recognized as being a partner to the USCCB and facilitating the Synod in the US, we were contacted by many lay apostolates and predominantly lay run ministries, uh, Catholic organizations of all kinds wanting to join us in our efforts. And the intention is really beautiful. It is to reach as many people as possible and ensure diversity across the theological and political spectra spectrum and all age groups. So I think what, what's encouraging about this, um, especially if we want to reach the 1 billion or 1.3 billion Catholics uh, existing on the planet today, uh, these ministries are very diverse. So through them, we can reach diverse members of our faith family and try to ensure that no one is excluded. Many of them are on the margins or kind of barely hanging on to their faith or to their membership in the church. And they don't regularly get a seat at the tables of discourse, analysis, and decision-making. We are impoverished by that. So we're training leaders to be facilitators and synthesizers, and the consequence is to reach these margins. Other thoughts on how the lady how lately ecclesial leaders can be involved. Um, Sister Natalie? Yes, truly the, the call for this uh, synod, uh, as Kerry said, and uh, as we have already mentioned, is a wide participation of all the diversity uh, of the people of God. So uh, each, each of us uh, uh, has to be a protagonist, but not only a promoter, uh, of the synod, so we have different charism, but the, uh, I think especially lay ministers and lay people who are already in responsibility in, in, in the church in the diverse way uh, could find ways to uh, foster this uh, synodal process in, in the local church, you know. And um, truly the aim 
of the synod is to learn or to relearn synodality. That is a learning by doing. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, the, the main challenge. It's to put synodality into practice. Uh, and, every, and it's a path of conversion. It, it's truly uh, a synodal, uh, the, the aim of the synod is a synodal conversion of the church that requires our personal conversion and the conversion of all. So uh, each of, uh, I, I think, uh, all the lay people, uh, all those who have a responsibility, can discern with others how to propose this synodal process. That is a process, as we have said, of deep listening, listening to each other, to listen to the Holy Spirit. So your first responsibility is to read the documents. The USCCB website for the synod is very, very well done. Well done. Uh, to be engaged in your diocese, if there is already not uh, a synodal process in your diocese, to talk about it, to discuss with others, with pastor, with the bishop, to, to help, uh, you know, uh, them to be engaged. Uh, it's, it's still possible. <laughs> we are not too late, you know. It, it, it's the first phase in the diocese, is the main one, it's until August. So you, every, each of you can do something. Thank you. Well, I'll, we've got some, we've got a lot. Oh, Father Wayne, I'm going to, we'll come to you and then we're going to jump into some of the questions we've got coming into the chat. So Father Wayne. Okay. I, I just want to um, unpack a little bit what, what uh, Sister Natalie just said, if that's okay, Sister Natalie. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, you know, in thinking about what does it mean? I, I love the idea of being a protagonist, being an agent of, of, um, a subject in this process, not just being a passive recipient and waiting for things to happen and then being angry when they don't happen. <laughs> um, I, I think it's really important to, to find out what is happening um, and what is not happening in your parish in, or your ministry, in your deanery and in your diocese. Um, and make plans to take part. If, if you don't know specific dates and venues yet, where it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, um, then, then keep, keep a lookout for it um, and ask questions. Um, come with good ideas, uh, not just to, the, to the, what you're invited to, but, but to those who are responsible in the diocese for this process or in the parish for this process. Um, you know, many lay people have uh, tremendous skills at this kind of thing that, that can help uh, the church in carrying out this process in an effective way. And, and don't be shy about bringing those gifts to, to the process uh, without being a pain about it, right? Uh, it's a massive undertaking. I think the church needs as much help as it can get, and I think many of us have gifts that we can contribute to that. And I think there are two really important things to communicate um, your interest to uh, those who are responsible for this process. One is in seeing, seeing the report that comes out of the process. Ask for the results. Ask to see and read the, the final report that comes from your parish, from your deanery, from your um, diocese, and from your region, and, and eventually from, from the, the country's bishops. Um, make sure there's follow-up. Uh, this is, as we said before, this is not just one moment in the church. The Pope Francis is calling this a way of being for the church from now on. And so the second thing is to expect follow-up. And if, if there isn't adequate follow-up, to ask for it and to propose ways that it can happen. And finally, keep asking the really important question, who is not at this table that should be here? And go beyond the obvious. Um, I hope you especially ask about persons with disabilities and their families. I think we leave them out far too often. And about people who don't speak English. Uh, we need to find ways to include them that are, that are life-giving for them. And then, um, whatever is the group you're thinking, why didn't he say this group? <laughs> Ask about them as well. Uh, keep asking the question, who's not at this table that needs to be here? So 
One of the questions that were, or actually several questions we're getting regarding the, uh, the synodal process is, a lot of lady are asking how not to be cynical about this process. I mean, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of, there's even some doubts, some questions, some misinformation that's out there. And so it, it, it has led some to be somewhat cynical or uh, passing over this process. So how can um how can we how can we respond to that as a as lay uh, number one as lay ecclesial ministers how can they respond to it but in general how can the church respond uh to that cynicism that some may be saying oh this is perhaps just another survey this is just another thing um by the way i think you spoke a little bit of this in the fact that follow the follow-up is important um, one of the conversations I know that I've had when I was involved with the Synod on Young People was it, don't just, you know, don't just let that be the last conversation you have with a young person. Um, let that be the first conversation of many that will follow. Yes, this first conversation may be the one that we really take and it helps inform our process, but it should never be the last one. So I really appreciate you kind of that's part of I think that's one response of how not to be cynical, of course, is to not make it just be. A, a one and done consultation but are there what other how else would you respond to those who might be cynical about uh the synodal process sister natalie go ahead yeah yes I, I just want to share something if we really believe uh and father when we call that and we all talk about that 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 synodality uh, you know, in this historic context, as we say, and especially also with the pandemic, all, all, all this crime, if we believe, as Pope Francis is stated, but not only him, that synodality is the call of God for the church today. It is the road uh, to embrace uh, for the church to be faithful to our mission, to proclaim the gospel and transmit the faith. So if synodality is the vocation of the church, if we truly believe that, you know, I have been involved in the vocation ministry during many years. I always said, God always gives the grace to answer the call is calling you. So uh, we have to be also confident uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit that has called the church to be synodal will continue to lead the church to this, uh, in this synodal path to help the church to really become more and more synodal. And what I see, and I understand, and it's normal in some places, we have seen it's not easy, it's difficult, but you know, it's about a change. And the church, like uh, other, sometimes other organizations, but we can really see that in the church nowadays, and I, I am lucky to have echoes and feedback from so many parts of the world, uh, the, the Holy Spirit is blowing and things change by capillarity also, you know. So uh, I think we can have this great confidence that God will give us the, to find the way, to discern the way, and the Holy Spirit will continue to lead us on this synodal path because it's a call of God. If, if I may, Paul, I... Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we in the cynicism isn't uh, limited to the United States, but if we're cynical in the United States, we do have a voice we should listen to, you know, and it's not necessarily one that wears a Roman collar. Uh, it should be the voice of our co-religionists, our neighbors, perhaps, who participated in a synodal process in the United States and came out at the other end greatly enriched. And I'm speaking about the five encuentros mm. that, have, that have characterized uh, uh, the life of the church in a very positive way, but like a lot of good news, it doesn't really get uh, dispersed. The encuentros, particularly the fifth one, which just formally finished uh, in September of 2018, uh, has left an indelible mark on the church that I serve here in uh, northern New Jersey, of uh, the 1.5 million people who identify as Catholic in our territory, about 40% of them are Latinos. And certainly the youngest um, uh, demographic in this archdiocese are Latinos. And the uh, what that listening process 
that is can be nothing else than a synodal process that was guided by the Holy Spirit produced in this archdiocese. It continues to excite me and gives me a direction as we go forward. Now, if we can broaden that uh, process to embrace the people beyond the Latino uh, community in the United States, with special attention also to everyone who is on the margin of that community, what a great uh, direction it'll be for the church as we move forward. So, you know, sometimes cynicism is very well merited, but sometimes cynicism, cynicism can be an escape mechanism mm -hmm. that allows me to escape from my reality and my responsibility. Um, I, I heard, and I'll finish, one of our most famous citizens here in uh, New Jersey actually lives on an island just off of the New Jersey coast, but it belongs to New Jersey, not to New York. And she's green and she holds up a torch and she, people recognize her. And I was reading uh, an essay by someone who I was writing from the country who gave us that statue. And I think Sister Natalie knows who's that, what country that is. And he said, the Americans have a nice statue of liberty and they're very proud of it. Perhaps what we need today is a statue of responsibility. And I think the uh, synodal process is a way of all of us getting beyond our cynicism to be co-responsible for the church. Thank you. Um, one of the one of our uh, listeners uh, is a parish priest, and he asked the question, what questions should I be asking of people? What would be the most beneficial questions to for the so that the synod has progress so that it can move forward? Um, oh, Carrie, Carrie, I'd love to. Let's jump to you right away. I love that question. What I would ask is, what breaks your heart? What breaks your heart? And have the courage and patience to really listen to the answer even when the answer is aspects of how we are church um, break our hearts. There's great, uh, there's a wonderful opportunity for all of us to be, to enter into a deeply truthful, vulnerable um, and prophetic dialogue right now. So I would start with what breaks your heart. Thank you. Um, another person asks, um, very honestly, as, a, as someone who is disaffiliated, how can they be involved in this process? Because a lot of these conversations we're having often talk about structures, you know, parish priest is engaging his parish, but what about those on the margins, especially those who are less active in their faith, um, who may still claim a sense of identity as, as Roman Catholic or as Catholic, uh, how can they be involved and how should they be involved in this process? And then maybe how can, how can lay people um, and church leaders uh, uh, in, in ordained and religious, how can they be involved in, in, in that process of connecting with uh, the disaffiliated, the, the disconnected. Any thoughts on that? Sister Natalie. Yes, it's, it's a great challenge. It's also a recommendation, you know, to listen to, as I said, all the diversity uh, of the people of God. Uh, not only those who are uh, in the parish every every weekend, but also those who are disaffiliated. So that's a recommendation of our uh, handbook, <laughs> you know, to help to uh, implement uh, and use the preparatory documents. That is the roadmap for for the synod, and we clearly state. Uh, and that's the call that we have to listen mainly to those who have no voices, also those who are the poorest, the peripheries, uh, those who are uh, no longer uh, who do not uh, practice. Uh, and even it, it, we can also, and it depends on the country, on the situation, but uh, we can also reach out uh, 
the question for, from other denomination and or, or people who are not uh, uh, Christian, but who have something to say to the church. As people of goodwill, they want to say something. So then it's a matter of how we can reach them out and uh, we need the creativity, we need to also, uh, you know, to foster the synodal process, not only within the parishes, that is very important, but also through all the diversity of the Catholic organizations, the schools and Catholic universities, you can reach out many uh, people, the, you know, prison chaplaincies or hospital chaplaincies, uh, uh, Caritas or other uh, organizations like that. Uh, there are many, many network, Catholic networks or organizations we can see, and that's also the way uh, to reach people. And also by neighbor, uh, your neighbors, uh, we need to be creative. Father Ryan. I, I think, um, thank you, Cardo Tobin, for mentioning the, the Quinto Encuentro, the, the fifth Encuentro, um, because I think it, it uh, in addition to the, the desire to reach out that just Natalie just mentioned, it, it provides a structure for reaching out um, where small groups gathered together and uh, reflected on scripture about being sent and then from that gain skills, um, learn skills. So I, you know, I think an important part of this process is formative. It's, it's a, it, sh it should be a process that is forming our people to, to, to seek out the very kind of people that are asking uh, this question. Um, to, to, so built into the Quinto Encuentro process was the effort of people in these small groups to go out into the neighborhoods and to knock on doors of people who are not active in the church uh, to ask them first of all to let them know the church is here the church is for you you are welcome but then to ask them what what do you want from the church how can the church be of service to you what do you need um so so if, if you're someone who's responsible for the process, asking about how to, how to reach out to disaffiliated, disaffiliated people, I think um, building it into the process and then having those people report back and including that in the listening that you're doing, I think is, is one way to, to reach out to, to the disaffiliated. If you are a disaffiliated person, and I, I understand why you might be, um, there are so many reasons. Uh, it's an opportunity. I think you'll find the church, you know, it's, I think Carrie uh, came close to, to really capturing the moment. And so the, the church's heart is broken because so many are disaffiliated. And, and I think that, that brokenness is, a, is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to, uh, to, that creates a space or that can create a space for those who are listening and attentive, um, where, that we can step into safely and say, hey, I'm here, I have something to say. This is what I need the church to be for me today. And I think a lot of it also starts with um, people sometimes wondering where they could find the disaffiliated if they're not in the church, how does the church leaders? I think and one of the one of the contributions of the lay, the laity and the lay, lay leaders is it's our sons and our daughters. It's our family members, it's our friends, it's the people we interact with on social media. Um, and, and, and it doesn't have to be an official conversation that has like handouts and all that. The conversation ideally could be very organic. Um, it could be, I mean, for those in the United States, we're about to celebrate the, the Thanksgiving. A conversation around the Thanksgiving table could be an excellent opportunity for that dialogue very informally, very organically, and then share that, share the fruits of that perhaps with those who are engaged in the church. Um, you know, share that with your, with your lay leaders, share that with your, your, your pastor. Um, so whatever mechanism is, is there. So um, where do you find them? I think we look around um, and I think we find those people. Um, we are closing at the end of our time here. And I, there are more questions then uh, we, we probably could be here for another couple of days. 
which says to me that there is a lot of enthusiasm, energy, um, a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. Um, you know, there has been in, uh, some questions do reflect um, that in the past we haven't maybe have lived up to a synodal spirit. Um, how do we avoid doing that in the future? And I think there's th that that's a certainly an area of concern, um, and 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 may not maybe on the local level or a diocesan or national level, there's been questions around that. So. Um, a lot of stuff churning up. This is not the last, uh, in fact, this is only the beginning of a journey that we're going to be taking uh, between our bishops, our, our, our lay leaders, our religious across the country in unpacking this idea of synodality and lay leadership. Um, we just have this really, this, this little snapshot where we wanted to get together with uh, some key individuals. Um, some questions that people asked also about resources. Um, where can I get, like Sister Natalie, you mentioned the booklet. Um, we'll, we'll post links to where they can find a lot of those resources. Uh, the U.S. Bishops Conference, the Catholic Apostolate Center will be continuing to provide resources uh, to be able to assist people in this country with this synodal process. So some of those resource questions that are in the chat, we'll make note of those um, and we'll certainly uh, send links to those out. And um, But um, as we have come to the end, I want to allow my uh, my esteemed panel to uh, to have a, a few final words. Um, but I, I I'll give you a final word, but I, but I, want, I have one qu final question for you. What is one thing about the engagement of the laity in this synodal process that gives you hope? Um, so uh, give us a few last words, and if you could share with us your hope uh, in this uh, synodal journey. So I'm going to begin with, uh, with Cardinal Tobin, then I'll go to Carrie, then Father Wang, uh, and then Sister Natalie. I think hope is a precious commodity, but it's uh, an absolute uh, essential for one who is, identifies as a disciple of Jesus. What gives me hope is the, lay, the laity's participation in the synodal process is that it is an opportunity for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit is the one that uh, gathers the church together not gathered, not started the ball rolling, but continues in every age to gather the church together and also to make reconciliation possible. And so the, uh, I see that this, this uh, new character of the, syn the synod manifest in a synodal process that is inclusive and all embracing uh, is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And because it is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, we have every right and almost we have an obligation to hope because of uh, it's going to be for our, the good of the, the world and the glory of God. Thank you. And, and people of, of faith are hopeful in the future. I mean, it's part, it's constitutive of being a person of faith is to have hope uh, to transcend what what we experience. Uh, what gives me hope, I'm, and I'm not sure everyone understands just how thoughtful Pope Francis, Cardinal Grex, Sister Natalie, and all of their collaborators, ordained religious and lay, have been in naming the, the attributes that are particularly important for this successful synodal process. When I heard Sister Natalie speak about these when we first met, I was struck by how resonant uh, those guiding principles were with the guiding principles that created Leadership Roundtable some 20 years ago, also out of a time of, of crisis, the abuse crisis. So uh, before any of us could even pronounce synodal process, let alone spell it, we had committed to these same attributes uh, to serve the church, prioritizing candor and charity, deep listening and dialogue, the presumption of goodness in one another, the value of diverse points of view and experiences, and the confidence that everyone has a piece of the wisdom to contribute, a commitment to prayer uh, and 
the introduction of moments of silence to specifically to invoke the Holy Spirit to be present and for us to be aware of her presence. That co-responsible nature of this process is, is remarkable. And it really is an invitation to everyone, regardless of how, where they see themselves in the church to be, to be part of this. Um, and finally, in addition to asking people soulful questions about like what breaks your heart, this is a perfect moment for us to be very candid about what it is we most love about the church and membership in this extraordinary, global, universal family of faith. I, I think you will be deeply moved when you hear people articulate what it is they most value about our faith and membership in the church. Thank you. Brother Wayne. Um, for my final comments, I I, um, I have to say this this week is Thanksgiving week. And um, so my my mind turns toward and my heart turns toward gratitude. Uh, thanks to the Secretariat for Laity, etc., and the Catholic Ap Apostolate Center for um, having these webinars and for inviting me to be a part of it. Uh, thanks to Cardinal Tobin for Carrie, Sister Natalie, for being a part of this. To uh, Paul, to you and to your coworkers, Sarah and John, um, for making this possible. And for everyone who's taking uh, their Monday afternoon to to further explore this important invitation to the church. Thank you. I'm I'm grateful for uh, for that. That gives me hope. Um, but that's not my response to the question yet. <laughs> One thing that gives me hope, um, apart from the sheer fact that it's happening, <laughs> just the fact that it's happening gives me a lot of hope. Uh, I think in many ways. Um, in the face of a rapidly changing world, I think we're finding that the way we have been church is not as effective as it once was. And we need to find new ways of proclaiming and living the gospel. Um, and our leaders are understandably challenged to discern what these new ways might be in the face of its complexity. And so it gives me tremendous hope that we are coming together in this way to prayerfully discern together how the Spirit is calling us to respond to the challenges, the complex challenges we face today. I believe that this process will unleash tremendous creativity and wisdom that is currently not available to us because we are not used to looking in the places where it is to be found or hearing the voices that bear it for a variety of reasons, mostly because our vision may be focused elsewhere or our hearing is not correctly attuned. But if you believe the church's conviction about the census fidelium, you have to believe that we won't get it wrong. That gives me hope. Thank you. And we come to Sister Natalie, you, you, you grace us for your presence from, uh, from the Vatican there. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, but, uh, yeah, what, uh, you, you get the final word on this panel. So, uh, so, uh, and, and we're very anxious to, to, to hear, um, especially since this, the, the, you know, the, the title of this webinar was lay leadership and synodality from the magisterium's perspective. So, um, you who work in kind of helping our, the magisterium of the church, uh, lead this process, um, we're very anxious. So sister Natalie, your thoughts. Uh, thank you so much, Paul, but uh, thank you so much, each of you and all the participants, you know, what gives me hope is, is just to, to leave that with you, uh, you know, uh, that the USCCB with, uh, uh, has uh, organized and proposed this webinar with also uh, a collaboration with the Center for Apostolates to see, I, I see all the diversity of the people who are here, you have lay people, you have priests, you have sisters, you have, uh, and, and on the panel, we have also the, the, the diversity of vocations <laughs> that give me hopes. 
uh, it gives me hope also to see uh, within uh, in the diversity of the diocese in the world i have seen so many lay people who have been appointed a coordinator for the synod or part of the national team or part of the diocesan team uh, this gives a lot of hope and to contemplate, as I have already said, you know, the, the creativity of the Holy Spirit uh, all around the world. And I want just for my final work to, to share this um, quote from Pope Francis at the opening of the Synod. He truly said, and that's my hope, that we all live the Synodal process as an event of grace. You know, the, my hope is that what we have experienced uh, those who were at the Synod on Youth uh, and uh, probably those in the Synod on the Amazon, uh, it was for me, it was the most impactful experience of my life. I have lived the church we dream, the, this church of uh, dialogue, fraternity, mutual listening, uh, prayerful style. And uh, so my hope is that everybody, all of you could experience that uh, and we, we live this new Pentecost. And when I see so many different synodal experience already uh, experienced in, uh, throughout the world, I, I, I give the example of uh, Rwanda. You know, they have a very uh, a genocide. Uh, some Catholic have killed other Catholic. After that, the church in Rwanda has organized a, a national synod for reconciliation. And they were able, through the synodal process and a way of listening, you know, to, to, to have a dialogue and to experience a path of reconciliation and healing. So if th those who killed each other before were able to, to experience that kind of synodal process, you know, even all our wounds and polarization and divisions uh, political or others, we, we can hope that there is a way with synodality uh, to, to find a path of reconciliation, healing, and uh, the dialogue. That's uh, to, to, to be in communion. That's my hope. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all for being a part of this conversation. Uh, this is recorded, so for, uh, for those who want to see it again, want to pass it along to others who might want to continue the conversation. Again, let this be um, the first step of a conversation that will continue over the next several months, several years, um, as we in dialogue on this. Um, we'll be back again uh, next year with another webinar um, to keep going deeper and to bring these questions uh, deeper into the conversation. So thank you all. God bless you. Have a blessed Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you.